Man, that's pretty cool. That's church right there. All right. So as we transition, I want to visit with you for a few moments about spiritual blindness. And I know we've got some children and we've got some youth in here. We've got some activity packs in the back if you want to engage with those also. Or adults, you need an activity pack. They're in the back as well. But I want to talk to you about spiritual blindness. And we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 8. And so if you have your Bibles or you have your Bible app, you can pull up Mark chapter 8. But, but let, me, let me help preface this just a little bit. I am, uh, to a certain degree, I'm visually impaired. I've been that way since fifth grade. I have worn some kind of correction lenses uh, on, my, on my face or my eyes since I was in fifth grade. So sometimes you'll see me in glasses today and wearing contacts. But when I began to, to have a hard time seeing, I didn't know I was having a hard time seeing until someone told me I was having a hard time seeing. So in fifth grade, what I noticed is that the blackboard began to be a lot more fuzzy. And I began to realize that the teacher began to be a lot more fuzzy. But because I didn't know I had bad vision, what I ended up doing was squinting and trying to make the best of it. And I did that over a period of time and it became normative. I got used to not being able to see the clear distinctions of my teacher or the blackboard. It's funny how that happens. You get used to being blind or needing healing until someone says, hey, you actually you are blind and you need some healing. So about six months after I began to experience this, I was walking through my house and my mom said, what's going on with you? And I go, what do you mean? And she goes, you're walking around like this all the time. And I go, I, I don't know. I, it became a habit. I didn't even realize I was doing it. And she said, tell me what's going on. And, and I said, well, I haven't really been able to see things for about six months. And she said, okay, we need to take you to the doctor. She knew immediately what I needed. I didn't know what I needed. I didn't have the capacity to know what I needed. I thought that was normative. If I can leave, live less than and no one's saying anything, then I'm going to get used to it. So my mama had to take me to the eye doctor. And sure enough, the doctor said, this is not the, uh, a catastrophic decision we have to make. You just need to start wearing glasses. I was like, oh, glasses, no, you know, and uh, contacts, ah, uh, and, and, but, you know, you just go through that angst. Healing sometimes involves angst because I had to get out of my comfort zone. But I'm so thankful that I got out of my comfort zone because my mama saw something in me that I didn't see myself because I was getting used to it. We're talking about spiritual blindness today. Many of us are walking around squinting. And we're having a hard time seeing where God is at work. We may envision God, but he's blurry around the edges. And when we look at the world around us, we really can't see in clarity what the Lord is doing. And we need someone to come and point out to us, we've been squinting way too long. And there's a way for you to have clarity starting today. Lord Jesus, we call upon you and we ask that your word will come alive and that those who are blind will begin to see and that those who are knowing will begin to comprehend. We thank you that you've already prepared the way, Lord. Now show us the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 8, what's going on to this point is that Jesus has, has fed 5,000 people and he's fed 5,000 people, and these were 5,000 religious people. And when God, went through Jesus, fed these 5,000 people, he didn't just do it barely. He didn't go, well, I'm just going to feed you to where we just have one cracker crumb left. No, he fed them to the point where there were 12 basketfuls of bread left. Like, we believe in a God of abundance, not scarcity. If you don't remember anything else today, we remember that we believe in a God of abundance, not scarcity. A little bit later, he fed another crowd of 4,000. And this crowd of 4,000 was primarily non-religious people. They didn't have any background. They were hungry and he met their need. In fact, he kind of loved where he lived and he loved the people he was with. He miraculously fed them and not just by scarcity going, man, I don't even know if I have it in me to feed all these people. We believe in God in human flesh in Jesus and Jesus fed them to where there were seven basketfuls full of bread left over. Let me say it again. We believe in a God of abundance, not scarcity. 
So what's happening in Mark chapter 8 is all that is happening. It's happened to disciples who've been walking with Jesus for the last three years or so. They've seen every miracle. They've heard every teaching. They've seen him in his unguarded moments. They should be getting, we would think, yeah, this is God in human flesh. And some of us have said, oh, if I could only see Jesus face to face right now, if I could just have a conversation with him right now, my faith would be so certain. Maybe that's the case. But you come from a long line of disciples that even when Jesus is straight in front of them, they still don't get it. So what's happening in Mark chapter 8, that's all happened, and he's walking along the road, and the disciples had forgotten. Everyone say forgotten. Yeah, man, that's, that's a tough word. Uh, had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. And here's what Jesus said. He said, be careful. Uh, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And uh, when I read this, I think about my mama. Uh, I've thought about my mama a lot, evidently, for the sermon this week. But my mom, uh, she used to make bread when I was growing up. And she would have yeast that she would keep in the refrigerator. And it only took a little bit of yeast to make batches of dough. And I remember that. So that's what I remember. I remember when I come back to this. And they discussed this with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? Jesus is the bread of life, y'all. Jesus had said that to the disciples. They've been fed to abundance. And yet they're still saying, I, we don't have any bread. And Jesus is like, I'm, I'm right here, guys. I mean, I'm like, come on, what else do I have to do for you to get this? That's how I imagine what's going on. And aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? Everyone say remember. So, we said forgotten before, now remember. And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves or the 5,000, how many baskets fulls of pieces did you pick up? They said 12. Great. And when I broke the, the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basket fulls of pieces did you pick up? And they said seven. And he said, do you still not understand? I, I, want, you to, I want you to think about as we talk about spiritual blindness for a little bit. I want you to think about remembering. Let me frame this for you. Whenever we come to worship, this is an act. One of the things that we do is we spend time remembering. We remember the mighty acts of God through Jesus Christ. The, the songs that we sing are, are songs that are based on the theology of, of, of God is good and God is a God of abundance and God will be with us always. And, and so when we sing these songs, and sometimes you're humming them as you leave, and sometimes they are the soundtrack to your life during the week, these are ways for us to remember that there's more going on in this world than perhaps what we see on TV. There's more going on in the world than the news that we read. There's more going on in the world than the thoughts that we are thinking in our brain. There's more going on than the feelings that we feel. Sometimes our feelings are not based in reality. They're just based in feelings. And there's more going on in this world. And so when we come to worship, one of the reasons that we sing songs is not just because they're catchy, it's to help us remember the theology that God was and God is and God always will be. And that helps frame what it is that we're going through in this world. We also remember when we focus on Scripture. There's a reason that we're going through the Gospel of Mark, and we've been going through it for, it seems like, a really long time. And the reason for that is because we want to remember and to be exposed to the teachings of Jesus that we wouldn't normally be exposed to or really spend time with. One of the things that also happens when we gather together in worship is we remember the mighty acts of God through the experiences of other people. I think one of the most foundational things that we have done within the culture of the life of this church over the last several years is we begin each meeting. And sometimes these are just business meetings, y'all. You know, we're talking about finance. We have a finance team, so we talk about finances of the church and like some of us are like, that seems like the most unspiritual meeting ever. We would be talking about finances, and then we talk about the trustees, and we have trustees meetings, and we're talking about the, the campuses, and how is it that we need to, you know, do whatever needs to be done, and we're like, that just sounds soul-killing. For some of us, we're like, oh, why would, that, why would we even do that? And then, you know, there's staff-parish relations, and we're like, oh, we really don't want to know what's going on with the staff, just make sure everything is good. And so we're like, please don't make us go to a staff meeting on that. And, and so some of us are like, oh, these business meetings, does the Lord even show up at those things? 
And I can tell you with 100% certainty he does. And you know the reason why I know that? Is because before we begin each business meeting, the question that we ask is, where have you seen God at work during the week? That reframes everything. Because it stops being about a, a spreadsheet for budget. It stops being about holes in the ceiling. It stops being about staff stuff. And it helps us remember that God is at work. There's almost nothing as powerful as when someone shares a story about how God is moving in their lives. You may not remember a sermon, but you'll remember someone sharing with you how God has touched their lives. Because it helps you remember or to take ownership for the first time that God is at work in and around you. So we begin each meeting going, hey, where have you seen God at work? And sometimes those testimonies, those stories, take 20 minutes of the meeting. And it's 20 minutes well spent because we're taking time to remember the mighty acts of God through Jesus Christ. If we don't do that, then we begin to have spiritual blindness. We begin to get so consumed with the spreadsheets and the holes in the ceilings and the staff stuff, or we get so consumed with our feelings, or we get so consumed with our thoughts, or we get so consumed with the news. Can I, can I tell you once again, just turn off the news, okay? If we get so consumed with the news, or we get so consumed with what our neighbor's saying across the, the fence, or we get so consumed about what our kids are doing, and so they become the little gods that we worship. And so we spend so much time focusing on all of that that until we take time to remember, we're going to have spiritual blindness because God begins to be fuzzy. And we can't really see where God is at work because we haven't spent time remembering or hearing the recollections of others of how God is moving in their midst right now. And spiritual blindness leads to further spiritual blindness because no one has come around us and said, hey, why are you squinting? One of the reasons that we do that at these business meetings is to come alongside one another and help remind them, hey, you don't have to squint anymore. God is in your midst, even if you didn't see it. And how encouraging that is. Spiritual blindness is pervasive. Unless we have someone like my mama, when I was needing glasses, come along and say, hey, I think we can get this fixed to change perspective. The story goes on in Mark chapter 8. They then came to a place called Bethsaida, Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him because Jesus is still in the healing business. Have y'all heard that we believe in a God of abundance, not scarcity? Have y'all heard that? Yeah, you need to be reminded of that over and over again. That even with your medical diagnosis or condition that you are in, we still believe in a God of abundance, not scarcity. I don't know if, if y'all get that yet. Even with whatever trials and tribulations you're going through with family, I'm not going to ask you to, invite your, to raise your hand, but we still believe in a God of abundance, not scarcity. And unless we have people around us to remind us of that, we are actually going to fall into the trap of thinking we believe in a God of scarcity. And he really doesn't have our best interests at heart. But we need somebody to come along and say, man, you, man, God is big. God is good. And God even has something going on with you. There's nothing in this world that can separate you from the love of God through Jesus Christ. Nothing. That's a remembrance. Anyway, so this blind man came to Jesus, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And, we had, and I love this imagery. When he spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? And he looked at him and said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, then his eyes were opened, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him home. Healing and recovering of, of spiritual sight, I would love to say that it happens every time in the blink of an eye. And for some of us, that's our expectation. If it doesn't happen now, then Jesus really didn't answer our prayer. But actually, uh, this is an example of it happening by degrees. And I want you to pick up on what's going on here. Jesus, a blind man was brought to him. Jesus took him by the hand, and he removed, them, removed him from the crowd. He removed him from the village. He went out kind of where he could have one-on-one -on -one time with this person. And I think that's really significant. In, in having your spiritual sight restored. Because some of us, it, we just need to remember, we end up taking on the characteristics of those we spend the most time with. So if, if we are spiritually blind and we're spending time with those who are spiritually blind, who aren't remembering or looking or sharing testimonies of how God is working, then that's going to begin to be our world. And until we're removed from that world, there, there's no hope 
to being healed because we keep on being influenced by those who are blind. It's the blind leading the blind. So think about the people you spend the most time with. Are any of them sharing how they see God at work? Are they helping you remember that God is good and that God is a God of abundance? Are any of the teachings that you're listening to helping you focus on a God of abundance or a God of scarcity? When, when, when you're the people that you have conversations with, are they all talking about how bad the world is, how bad the school administration is, how bad the teachers are, how bad your neighbors are? They're just complaining all over the place. That is a surefire recipe for becoming completely blind to the ways of God. And some of you are so deep into that hole, you can't even see it because you're blind. And Jesus comes and says, let me, let me get you out of this toxic system here. Let me pull you out here so you can see me through clear eyes. And he begins to do his work on you. So that then you might begin to have eyes to see so that you can come in and start influencing your people. Christianity is not just about running away and hiding from the boogeyman. You were saved on purpose for a purpose so that you can go and help other blind people receive their sight. You know that, don't you? Yeah, that's part of being a Christian. And when he began to receive healing, Jesus tried it once, but he was so blind, he had to try it again. And for some of us, we need to let Jesus do what he needs to do to begin helping us see clearly. So let me ask you a question. Where is it that you've grown content of just seeing things in a fuzzy way? What have you what have you done or what ha how have you become just living normatively less than the way God created you? Uh, Michelle gives me a hard time in love because she's my spouse. It's always a hard time in love, okay? And because I've been saying this because I truly believe it. For years I've been saying this. My kids have heard it also and they're like, oh, dad, you know, rolling their eyes. But they roll their eyes in love, right? But I, but I, I believe this. Jesus created you for more then what you settled for, that is about spiritual blindness. And he's not content for you to walk around seeing him in a fuzzy way or not being able to see the significance of how he's working in your life in a cloudy way. He's like, man, I came to give you life and give it to you abundantly. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. And also the promise is that, that God in his infinite love and character moved into your neighborhood so that you would know the full expansiveness of God's grace and that you wouldn't have to navigate this life being blindfolded. How is it that you need healing today? I don't know if you've heard this, but we believe in a God of abundance and not scarcity. And when we're talking about spiritual blindness, we're really talking about a matter of the heart. And I want to pray for your heart right now. And maybe you have someone that the Lord's placed on your, on your mind right now that you need to pray for that they're spiritual sight might be restored. I don't know who that is, but I trust the Lord's going to lead you. Would you go to the Lord in prayer as I pray for you, and you pray for that person whom the Lord has placed on your heart right now. Lord Jesus, we, we pray through your abundant mercy and grace that you will do what only you can do and that you will bring healing to those who have grown accustomed to living less than Lord, I pray that you will put people in our lives that will help us see that we've been going through this life squinting and have grown accustomed to it. Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will touch our eyes, that you will unclog our ears, that you will soften our hearts, and that we may begin being healed by you right now. Lord, we pray that that healing will begin to take place right now to your glory and to the benefit of us and the benefit of those who will be blessed by us going back and telling the good news of how you are working. Lord, we thank you and we love you. You are so generous and so kind. Do your wonder-working power in us and through us right now. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. I want to invite the, the